Thank you for coming today. I'd like to welcome you to the first event in the fash Ugh. <laughs> Faculty Professional Development Series, hosted in partnership with Educational Technology and Innovation. Our speakers today, Kayla Bolinski and Don Kilpatrick, will be speaking about course learning outcomes. Visiting Assistant Professor in Liberal Arts, Kayla Bolinski, received his Michigan Teaching Certification and BA in English from Michigan State University and his MFA in Creative Writing from Temple University. Caleb has worked as an adjunct professor at multiple schools in the Philadelphia and Detroit areas, focusing on composition and rhetoric, as well as world literature. He recently served as a subject matter expert on a curriculum development committee and presented on writing as a craft and transfer as a cognitive process at the Foundations in Art Theory and Education Conference. Illustration Chair Don Kilpatrick received his BFA in illustration from Utah State, and his MA in illustration from Syracuse University. His work has been featured in publications such as Fortune, the LA Times, and the Wall Street Journal, and he was involved in the design of the Olympic medal for the 2002 Salt Lake City Winter Games. He has received numerous awards, including from the Society of Illustrators, and is a founding member of the Detroit Wood Type Co. and Signal Return, and has exhibited his artwork throughout the US, including New York, Philadelphia, and Miami. We're so grateful that both of you are here today. And Caleb, we're gonna go ahead and turn things over to you. All right, uh, thank you, Amy, for that, that wonderful introduction. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how I got involved working on course learning outcomes in the liberal arts department. So this began uh, in December of 2022. Uh, the liberal arts department had an opportunity uh, with, the, with ed tech. Ed tech had an opening in their calendar where they could focus uh, almost weekly uh, uh, with us about developing some uh, course canvas shells. Um, and so that ended up being about a, a 15 to eight week, 18 week process, but it began the first few meetings all dealt with uh, discussing the course learning outcomes. And this was a very collaborative way to begin. Uh, it very much felt like, like an ongoing brainstorming session. Uh, we dedicated a couple of hours over the course of a couple of meetings. Uh, and so in those meetings, there were uh, members of ed tech there was also uh, a, a, a chair from liberal arts and then uh, a number of subject matter experts. And uh, that's how I was brought in. I was brought in as a subject matter expert for my experience teaching composition one and composition two. And so that's one thing I, I found very helpful about this process is having other people to talk to, especially when you're trying to um, think through specific language choices when it comes to course learning outcomes, uh, having other people that can help you work your way out of uh, those those uh, those dead ends that you might work your way into or writer's block, essentially. Um, and we didn't treat anything like it was like it was locked in stone. Uh, we used a an online collaborative space, a Miro board uh, to just hash out our ideas originally. And we were able to come back to those and craft those. We also uh, once we had a set of learning outcomes that we liked, we shared them with other instructors who we knew were going to be teaching these courses to get their feedback and see how we could collaborate across uh, across everyone's input a little bit. Um, so that's what you have here. I came on board just as a, a subject matter expert, uh, willing to, to put my expertise and my experience uh, into the mix uh, with other professionals who, who were doing the same. Um, so we started off with composition one. We knew that we were looking at two courses and thinking about how they were going to build on each other. So we started uh, at, at the very beginning of Composition 1. Um, we wanted to focus on three to five course learning outcomes. We found that that was the most uh, manageable number for designing a course and for communicating with students. Uh, anything more than that tends to get a little uh, over overwritten um, and a little bit uh, hard to, to manage um, on both sides of the, of the, the classroom. So you can see with composition one, we had six to begin with. So we knew we wanted to pare these down a little bit. Uh, just looking over what we began with, I really want to take a look at number two here, write and revise a college level argument of five pages. Um, one thing that you'll notice about that, that original outcome, 
that's focusing on, on a content expectation, a specific task that uh, we're hoping students would accomplish and, and a product that would come out of that. And that felt very, very rivet, rigid to us. Uh, similarly, if we look at something like uh, number five, define and avoid plagiarism. Um, there's many ways you could approach that process, uh, but in terms of the outcomes, it was a very specific and we felt kind of limiting outcome. So the revisions that we made were things like develop skills to support learning objectives in college courses. This is much more open-ended in terms of what the content is gonna look like. This means that uh, different instructors coming to this course have room to maneuver. Also, when we're responding to students' uh, interests about you know, how are we using these course outcomes or how does this course relate to my other courses, uh, there's an opportunity right there to start thinking about what skills begin to transfer between courses and, and how in the liberal arts department we're trying to nurture some of those basic study skills. Um, similarly, analyze college level reading material. This opens the door for many different types of reading material and assessments about what those materials look like depending on the students. Uh, create thesis driven writing projects that engage with college level material and grammatically and mechanically correct. Uh, again, this isn't a specific type of paper. Uh, this allows instructors to teach what they're comfortable with and constantly respond to the different court, the different uh, classrooms that they're encountering, the different students in each classroom. Reflect on college level writing process. We felt that reflection was very important. Uh, part of having students begin to, uh, to, to, to uh, uh, learn about their own metacognition, thinking about and assessing themselves. And then communicate themes, ideas, and critiques of artwork. And again, we were really thinking about how does this uh, liberal arts course, which is a, a gen ed for many students, uh, many of the students are not minoring in a liberal arts course, how do we, or a liberal arts program, how do we make sure that we're, we're giving them skills and working with ideas that they're going to be able to apply in all their other courses, and hopefully also opening the door for them to bring some of their experiences in, in their studio classes into the classroom. So for composition two, again, we wanted to begin to try to limit the number of course learning outcomes to three to five. You can see that composition two began with seven, so it was even more unwieldy. And we felt we could really narrow these down, especially because we were building on what we were already establishing in composition one. We were really thinking about this as what is the second half of that experience? What is the clear endpoint we're trying to reach with students when they complete the, these, these two courses together? And that allowed us to actually focus on three CLOs for this course. And I think this is something that, that's important for us all to think about. Uh, as we get into higher level courses, or if we're, uh, we have students who are uh, going through a set of courses uh, with a plan of, of how they approach these, these um, the, the different courses in an order. Uh, we can think about as we get into higher level courses, we can begin to be more specific and we can limit some of those CLOs as long as we're working on the knowledge that of, of uh, what we've seen students do before and the, the, the types of the learning outcomes that they're already mastering in, in early courses. So what we came up with here, things like interpret literature and artworks through creative projects, including written, oral, and other forms of communication. Again, we're trying to open that door so there's the possibility of transfer. Um, evaluate texts, images, and cultural artifacts through rhetorical analysis. So we are being specific about uh, wanting to, to practice a specific type of, of lens for analyzing work. But again, we're really making a lot of opportunities for instructors and students to, to play creatively in that, in, in that space. And then synthesize central arguments and key ideas and academic text through the process of reflection and research. And again, you see that idea of reflection being something that we want to think about. Uh, we, we show our students these CLOs at the beginning of the semester. Is there a way that we can kind of come back to them? Uh, is there a way we can reiterate them, not only through all of our assignments, but also as we see students actively learning. And one way to do that is to focus on reflection from the beginning. Building reflection in uh, gives us an opportunity to constantly come back and, and reassess these uh, experiences, both as instructors and, and for our students. So what became a real uh, guiding light in this process, uh, we, we looked at Bloom's taxonomy. Um, this was originally desi designed in the, in the 50s, but it's been updated in the 2000s, and there's many different forms people have found to play around with these ideas. So although you see on the on one side of the screen here that pyramid, which very much has kind of the hierarchy uh, built into the design of it, 
on the, the learning in action, the rose mandala that we see, uh, it's not as hierarchically structured, which I think some people find a much more easier to approach. Again, that sense of kind of creativity, curiosity, play, not kind of having such a rigid expectation. And what we really looked for in Bloom's Taxonomy, we're focusing on verbs. Um, you can even, if you Google Bloom's Taxonomy, one of the suggested searches is verbs. Um, and we were thinking about how can we focus on skills rather than tasks or content? Uh, that was a, 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 a big point for us in terms of uh, choosing specific language. Uh, we weren't trying to prescribe what the assignments would do would be. We weren't trying to prescribe um, specific you know, test models um, or expectations of, of how everyone's work would be similar. Uh, we really wanted to think about uh, what are the basic skills we're hoping that students will acquire. And that also allowed us to think more about this idea of transfer. How do those skills transfer? Transfer from a composition one to a composition two course. Um, uh, one of the, one other required course in liberal arts is, is uh, uh, World Lit, which I'll, I'll show you a little bit about that right now. I've been thinking about how does what students are completing in comp one and comp two transfer to world lit. Um, and I've also been thinking about how do these things transfer to studio classes and and vice versa as well. Um, and so that's that one thing if, if uh, I would I would recommend to, to anyone thinking about this, um, go back to the Bloom's taxonomy, take a look at some of the different iterations and designs people have come up with it. Um, try to find one that, that you feel comfortable with and that, that excites you. And then really think about those specific language choices where you're making when you're writing these, these course learning outcomes. So uh, what I would like to do next is I'm teaching a world literature class. This is a, a required course for, for sophomores. Um, and I, I'm right now working with the, the standard CLOs we've had for several years. And I'm sure just from this short presentation, you can already begin to see some of the things we might want to address in trying to revise these course learning outcomes. Uh, number one, read critically for content and style, approximately 20 to 50 pages a week. Uh, again, that's a very specific task about what the content in the course is going to look like. Uh, it can be very hard for uh, someone new to a course to design around that. It also sets a very specific and rigid expectation for students, especially if you know we're, we're having most of these conversations early in the semester with them, uh, that idea that, that it's, a, it's a specific um, goal that we're trying to reach. Uh, write a critical essay using modern language, association, style, and documentation. Again, we get 20 pages of dull space, 12 point text composed outside of class during the course of the semester. Again, very focused on a task and the content that comes out of that task. Doesn't really get into what the skills being practiced there are and how these skills could show up in, in other areas of, of a student's work or study. Uh, use literary terminology effectively. Again, we get define and avoid plagiarism and use libraries to access books, journals, and other print or electronic sources. Uh, so looking at this list, as I mentioned, number one and number two and number four, uh, those are kind of, of great, these examples I would point to of, this is very much focused on, on the content of the course and uh, having students accomplish specific tasks and not getting them to actually practice uh, the skills that we're hoping that they'll be they'll be mastering and, and becoming familiar with and kind of keeping in their mental toolbox as they navigate their their other courses. All right. So I'm going to stop there and I'll pass it to Don. Thank you so much, Caleb. That was very interesting. And I really liked being able to see kind of the one to one um, of the course learning outcomes that you developed. Thank you. So. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Amy, for inviting me to present on this. This is a topic I'm very passionate about. Um, I'll share my screen here. Now, so this is something I feel very passionate about. And and this is something where I, I you know, when I've typically, at least when I started out uh, planning classes, the conventional wisdom was that writing an outcome, writing and thinking about course objectives or course outcomes seemed to be the task that I would save to the last. I would flush out a class 15, 16 weeks, and then I would, you know, do that at the very end. And I'm really going off of what I was taught and just really how I pitch things in, in industry. Um, but this book I came across a few years ago, and, and this has been a real great uh, resource, both for myself. You can see it's a well-worn copy here by Bruce Mack. And uh, I go through this regularly with new faculty that are brought into my department. 
And I also refer to it quite often for myself. Um, specifically, chapter three of this book is what I'm going to is what I'm outlining and referencing today with you all. So really, it's turning conventional wisdom on its head and writing the outcomes and the course objectives first before I plan out and flush out 15 weeks. Very similar to what I do in my discipline as a working illustrator. It's really the concepting phase, the early phase of, of creating an image. And uh, so the big questions that you want to ask, and again, very unconventional way, because typically when you ask these questions, you have how first, whereas he asked the question, why, how, and what? So the first question is, why should students take this course? It's really important as you are developing a course or revising a course to understand where it fits into things. Is it a gen ed requirement? Is it a foundations requirement? Is it a major minor requirement? a general elective or a major or minor elective? How, how does this course fit into the student's educational experiences? What are the prerequisites? Where does it fit into that? Where's that puzzle piece, so to speak, fit into the grander puzzle? Is it beginning, intermediate or advanced? And most importantly, what is the primary purpose? And I'm kind of calling this out specifically here because there's so many things involved with a primary purpose when you're developing a course and you're thinking of the outcomes and objectives. What are the, is it general knowledge? Um, Caleb spoke to that a little bit in his presentation. Is it discipline specific knowledge? Are there general skills? Are there discipline specific skills? Is it professional preparation and experience? And all things can relate back to that. Even the attendance policy that you have in your syllabus, it can reinforce, for example, professional preparation and experience. So what, what do I want the students to learn in the course? This for me is the hardest question of all. Um, and it's something that is somewhat of a moving target. But what I recommend is, is definitely, it, it, this is where the collaboration comes in. It's speaking with your department chair and other faculty who have taught the course to work together to uh, either revise or prepare that course so that it's relevant to your students' experience. Additionally, we should definitely keep this on our dashboard as we want to make sure our goal should be to create curriculum that supports disciplinary norms, what's happening, um, and is aligned with CCS requirements, both of which determine what our students must learn during our courses, right? That's, that's the big thing is we want to make sure that it's relevant to our departments, but that we're also cognizant of the CCS community and, and those requirements. So, for example, where I'm asking these questions, you know, and, and the it doesn't have to be super complex, but I'm asking, you know, as an example, this is how figure illustration one, a first semester illustration course fits in. So why should students take this course? And as I describe here, it's because this is one of those core courses that the illustration department is determined will provide all of our students with a high quality education of the fundamental elements of a professional illustrator and narrative picture maker. How does this course fit into the student's educational experience? It's the first step. It's the first touch point that a student has in our department um, before they really enroll in any other illustration courses if they choose. And this course is generally completed within the first two semesters of a student's experience at CCS. What should the students learn from this course? Students will acquire a broad knowledge of the drawing of the human figure in all its diverse form, including proportion, anatomy, and the relation of the human figure to the surrounding environment, figure ground or perspective. So that's really just the exercise I pulled off there with, with one course, but th that's really the starting point. And sometimes you have an existing syllabus to go from. Sometimes you're developing it from scratch. And I, I suggest if you're developing it from scratch, a lot of my presentation is really assuming that you have an existing syllabus to work with and you're comparing content, outcomes, objectives. But when you're developing it from scratch, it's good to have that uh, course title, obviously, and the course code so that you can understand whether it's a beginning, intermediate, or advanced course that you're developing, among other things. So how do these two things differ? Um, outcomes broadly describe the learning the student should have achieved by the end of the course or a program. And objectives designate specific goals of the program, course, or even an individual lesson or activity that you have within a class. Um, and that is defined in the terms of the skills or knowledge that a student will acquire or demonstrate as a result of that instruction. So, in short, outcomes are where we want to be. Objectives are the steps needed to get there. Um, you know, my dad used to always say, I, I look at the big problem, I break it down into steps, and I walk those steps. 
we might see this as a progression from the more uh, general or most general learning out goals to the most specific illustrator actions or instructor actions, sorry. Um, this is kind of an up-down ziggurat here. You know, you have, you're going from outcomes, the most broad and general to objectives, then to assessment, assessment of that lesson or activity or project, then the day-to-day -day instruction. You know, we're planning that way, but actually when we deliver, um, you know, we, well, when we plan, we go from the top down, we have this upside, upside down pyramid or ziggurat that we're working with. But when we're actually instructing, we are going, we implement, we actually execute from the bottom to the top. We really start with, you know, we're instructing and we're, we're assessing as we go, especially in, in, well, any course really, whether it be studio or lecture, um, going from objectives then out to the outcomes, which are the broad sort of um, the broad, the broad big picture of where we see ourselves going or in our students. So developing outcomes, how do you go about doing that? Caleb talked about Bloom's taxonomy and how you can find it in all these different forms and charts. And, you know, some are columns, some are that more circular sort of design. Um, it's really something that dis, you know, might vary from discipline to discipline, um, depending on all of the different nuance within that discipline and the the knowledge of practice and, and um, all the different sort of things. But uh, the outcomes for each course that we develop should align with outcomes that have already been developed for an entire program or specific tracks within that program, maximizing the potential for consistency across all the courses. So as you can see here, using Bloom's taxonomy, these are the areas in which you should take to start working on your outcomes, examine the accreditation standards for your particular academic discipline. I know that some programs at CCS have very specific um, accreditation standards. We all have accreditation standards. And, and you know, if you're not aware of those, it's really a great opportunity for you to reach out to Nadine Ashton, to the deans, um, to the academic affairs, and, and start that dialogue and conversation. It's very informative, and you can get a lot of really great information from them. Um, consult professional organizations in your discipline. Um, know what's happening within your quote unquote industry. And I use that term very broadly because industry is one thing for one group and it's quite a different for another. But, you know, find those organizations within your discipline. Consider what their guidelines are, their goals. For example, I teach a beyond the portfolio class within illustration. It's all things business and self-promotion. And one of those standards is the Graphic Artist Guild, it's a mouthful, Pricing and Ethical Guidelines Handbook, <laughs> the 16th edition. That has a lot of really great standards in it as to how a, a professional illustrator should conduct themselves and other disciplines as well too. Um, evaluate the syllabi for all the courses you've taught or syllabi from your colleagues' courses. You know, if you are, you know, teaching for the first time a course within your program, it's always a great idea to take and compare what you are planning and what you have envisioned with what is established by the department. Um, as Caleb alluded to with, with liberal arts, there are established course learning outcomes that they have established. Um, my department does as well. I'm sure most every department, if not all, have that as well. So make sure that you aren't, you're, you know those, and that, that really uh, sets a, an opportunity for you to have great discussions with your department chair while developing this. Um, investigate your department and CCS has published goals, objectives, values, mission statements, bylaws, or similar statements, i.e. the North Star, right? We're working on the strategic plan right now. Be aware of what's going on and participate in that process. That will inform, yes, it will inform that course at the grassroots level of what we're doing here at the college. And then assess degree program requirements relevant to the course you're planning. Make sure that uh, it's the appropriate amount of, of contact hours and content and everything else, all that good stuff. Um, and just some examples of some um, Bloom taxonomy charts that I personally use. I, I deal better with columns and, and rows. Some people deal better with a circular design that just kind of confuses me and, and uh, you know makes me just makes my mind wander. And I think this kind of helps keep me on the focus here. But as you can see, there's different levels of knowledge, right? And even though it may be a beginning course, there might be more advanced skills that you're covering in that course or intermediate. You know, be really specific to that. And, and as, as Caleb was mentioning, I, I really love the fact that they are really limiting the amount. There's only so much that you can do within a 15 week time frame. Don't try to pack 30 weeks of content into 15. It's just not good for anyone. 
Um, this is the chart from Bruce Mack's book, very similar to the last one, but they all kind of vary. But the key when you're writing outcomes is you're not using vague language. You're not using vague verbs. You're using uh, as best you can measurable verbs, being specific. Um, we've got a great language. Let's use it to this to its specificity. Um, and this is a chart that he talks about in, in his book where when he's starting out, he takes in the one column here to the left, you see all of the different content areas that I was talking about a couple of slides back. He gathers that information into one column, and then he starts really brainstorming on the right-hand side outcomes that are based upon those uh, five, six areas that, that he gathers research from. Um, and, and again, it's it's uh, accrediting, accreditation, professional organizations, syllabi from other courses or similar courses or the same class that was maybe taught five years ago and you're teaching again for the first time. Exciting to be revising that. Um, so once you've created those outcomes and you have a working idea of how those go, I think it's really important to start thinking about your course objectives. Now, you see these four steps here on this slide. I would recommend you start at step three if you have an existing, um, if you, or, or rather if you don't have an existing uh, syllabus. If you have an existing syllabus, start at step one. Hopefully that makes sense. I, I hope I didn't get that mixed up. Okay, so um, really step one is you're comparing, and you're comparing and contrasting the existing syllabus, the outcomes from the existing syllabus. I recommend taking two different color pencils or two different color highlighters to, you know, using one color for the old syllabus or the, the one you're comparing against and use the other for, um, you know, similarities. So basically I would use blue to show the differences between the two and yellow for the similarities between the two. And if you're finding that there's a lot of blue there, that's really something that you should consider and look and figure out why is there such a discrepancy between the two? And, and you know maybe there's a major change that's happening. So maybe what that would be involved is maybe that course needs approval through the various committees and, and structures that we have here at CCS, or you know it's really just a way to assess and figure out where to go next, okay? Um, and I'm just going over these things quickly. I highly recommend getting a copy of this book where you can go more in depth. Step two, analyze your findings, examine the areas of similarity and the differences that you've identified, and then think about what you're gonna do next. So um, step three, determine specific content within the course context. Um, again, like I'll reiterate, you step to the, you skip to the step if you have, if you're starting a syllabus from scratch, um, but think about the level of your course. You, know? um, you may wanna do something that is maybe more appropriate in a junior level course, for example. Um, but how could you take and revise what you want to do to where it can be an introductory uh, lesson or something that really helps a beginning student uh, set them off to success? Um, you know, this is where you can really apply that knowledge you have being a subject uh, matter expert to your discipline and to determine whether your objectives are appropriate or even realistic. And then lastly, write those objectives. Write objectives that align with your outcomes. Sometimes they're not a one-to-one. -one. Sometimes a, an objective includes two or three different, um, different outcomes into one objective that you have for a lesson. Uh, sometimes, you know, so, so you have to kind of look at that and not try to think of it as a one-to-one -one comparison. And then lastly, every action tied to a student's course grade should be tied to an objective. I believe, I'm firmly believe that if you have an attendance policy and you have a very specific attendance poly, policy, for example, for your course, that is an opportunity for you to reinforce that outcome in that course that stresses professionalism, that stresses um, punctuality or, or something along those lines that really helps you reinforce the bigger scheme because that attendance does, that's a specific activity, right? Think about that ziggurat that goes to that big outcome of where we want to be. Right. OK, so those are the more specific ways in which you get there. This is what I, I like, too. This is something that I try to keep in mind for myself as well as my faculty. I actually have a copy of this that I tape up in my office, my messy office here. And it's really the iterative process that I deal with as an illustrator. It's constant revision, going through the cycle, 
and constantly looking at what you have and making it better. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of not always being satisfied with where we're at, but trying to find where can we even make it better. And sometimes in the process of doing that, we create something new. And sometimes we really do. Sometimes we realize what we've not been doing quite right and we ditch it. So it's really just identifying, ideating, implementing and iterating, and then going back again and identifying as we, as we go through this process, it's really, it, it comes natural to us in this studio setting in an applied art and design college. And it's something that we do naturally. And we just kind of don't think about, I think sometimes, or we take for granted. And this is something that I, I really recommend. So there you go. Sum it up. I know I've gone long here. Outcomes are where we want to be. Objectives are the steps to get there. Uh, course objectives and outcomes must align and also support institutional requirements. And the process of uh, composing outcomes and objectives involves analyzing from multiple sources, taking all that research and then writing them. And thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate taking the time. I told you I was going to go long, but uh, at least I got in a, a little bit over 15. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Don. That was very illuminating. Um, so we do have time for some questions. Uh, are there any questions offhand? Okay. Um, so while uh, other people are thinking of their questions, I do have one for both of you. Um, how do you incorporate an inclusive lens when crafting your, your course learning outcomes? How do you make sure? I can I can start with that. Yeah. Um, one of the things I definitely thought about uh, when, when working on these uh, was beginning every semester, you, know, you have students that, that come and tell you either, uh, you know, just just uh, having a, a brief conversation with you or they have a documented, but, you know, they have they have specific needs or um, they need some kind of, you know, they're, they're wondering about what accommodation looks like in, in your classroom. Uh, so I always think about with when making accommodations, uh, no, we're not trying to change the the ultimate uh, outcome, right? We want the student to still be getting the same type of experience, gaining the same type of skills. We're not bringing the, uh, the we're not trying to lower an expectation or raise an expectation of this, right? But we're trying to change the ways that we help the student get there. That when we're making those accommodations, we're, we're making uh, making uh, changes in the process, but still trying to make sure everyone's getting to, to, the, to the same place together. And that's one thing that I found, you know, instead of just focusing on tasks and content in these outcomes, but focusing on skills makes that a lot, a lot more possible. Uh, there's much more fluidity and plasticity when thinking about uh, the different ways we can we can help a student reach competency within a skill than the stricter expectation. So I definitely thought about that, thought about that a lot. Um, you know, we, we can we can uh, create equity in our in our lessons by having outcomes uh, that allow for uh, easy and, and have the expectation that accommodations are, are going to be part of the process. Um, and and kind of like Don was saying that that that's in that space between outcome and objective. Uh, there we see the possibility to to make those accommodations and bring more people in. Yeah, I I I really love what Caleb's saying here, and and as he was mentioning what what he does when he how he meets the individual where they're at is how I'm interpreting what he's saying. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel for me, um, and I'm taking this approach uh, with with courses I'm teaching this semester, where it's about the experience, and it's I I know I, in the process of of meeting individuals or students where they're at, I've learned a lot about myself. How do I learn, and how do I connect? Um, and it's through experience. It's really, it's that hands-on experience that that we we have, that we take again for granted as, as an applied art and design college. And that's something that I'm just really leaning into. And I'm finding great results already. We're just barely a month into it. And I'm seeing students respond to that approach uh, because it's not as strict. It's about them really finding their way, finding their medium and, and meeting where the individual where they're at. Thank you. We do have a question in the chat from Carl. He says, you both talked about assessment. How do you look at the alignment between your outcomes and the assessments slash projects? Do you mind if I jump in, Caleb? So it, it's it's directly involved. I mean, I think the assessment, like I was mentioning with that upside down ziggurat, the assessment is happening. You know, that's the view from the trenches, right? So my assessment, it's a constant thing. It's it's small little things like, hey, did, did they upload the file correctly? D 
do they need, you know, maybe there's more messaging to remind them or it needs to be clear in the project brief. Um, it's assessing whether or not they're, they're really understanding the objective of that assignment. So the assessment is happening on a nonstop basis. And for me in a studio-based course, um, you know, for example, today, my students were, were drawing from the Henry Ford collection and I'm, you know, I'm doing assessments on the fly. Are they photographing the, the items that the curators put out for us? Are they drawing them from multiple angles? Those, those are things that I specifically put into the project, but then, um, what, what one of my outcomes for that course is very specifically directed to, um, drawing surface qualities. These items had, you know, one had velvet, one had silk, et cetera. And, you know, so, so the, the small things happening day to day do reflect to those bigger, the object, the objectives, and more importantly, the outcomes, whereas like, that's the big vision. That's the, the grand panoramic view that we see at the end. It's the looking out at the grand Canyon, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, so while working with with ed tech as a as a subject matter expert, um, the, the 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 first step after the first step we took was uh, you know revising these course learning outcomes, and then the next step was looking at the major assignments and and designing those major assignments with those course learning outcomes in, in mind. Um, so that was that was our, uh, in, and I was thinking about that uh, while while uh, paying attention to, to Don's presentation. That yeah, kind of the order that we do things and kind of where we start uh, is very important in this. Um, so yeah, the second task after thinking about these outcomes was starting to think about major assignments and kind of how those how those uh, map over to them. Um, and then on top of that, uh, while working with a tech, um, Gretchen and Brandy. Um, were were uh, in the background while uh, the SMEs were trying to to write lessons and think about assignments. Uh, they were helping us actually map all of that. So I'll just do a, a quick screen share here. Um, but this is this is the the DEN 102 composition two. This is the course map. Um, and with this this simple grid here, uh, we have the, the the course learning outcomes. So those three from, from comp two, the interpret literature and artworks, the evaluate text images and other cultural artifacts, and the synthesize central arguments and key ideas. And then uh, we were able to, to uh, map for each lesson what the objectives we were coming up with each lesson were, and then the, the tasks or activities or exercises or assignments that went along with that. So that's what this, this number coding is from. Uh, this is from uh, module one, part one, module two, part uh, module one, part two, module two, part three. We can see some of these uh, objectives are used for multiple lessons while reiterating. So we were able to, to literally uh, map it out. Um, and so, yeah, uh, to, to Carl's question, um, you know, that was also very helpful now in, in trying to communicate to students why we're doing something at a certain time. Uh, how it relates to other things, um, especially I find with the uh, with the composition course I teach, um, I only meet with my students once a week. Uh, so being able to really explain to them kind of the the schema that is being used, um, you know, within each lesson, but also week to week and assignment to assignment, I think really helps kind of make the work feel a lot more present uh, and not just like uh, you know once a week I have to go to my liberal arts class, uh, but they can kind of see how it's how it's contributing throughout the semester. Thank you so much. Um, and Carl appreciated the examples. Nadine, you have your hand up. I just wanted to offer some information. Um, great job, Caleb and Don, both of you provided really good info. Don, in your presentation, you um, you said that, you know, you should consult other syllabi. And I just wanted to let everybody know that CCS has um, a syllabus library that's available from Simple Syllabus. If you're not familiar with it, I just put it in the link for everyone to access. So if you're starting this process, it is helpful to look at others' courses and how they write their learning outcomes. But everyone should have access to that. And if you don't have access, then you can contact Carl and, and he'll hook you up with access. Thanks. Thank you so much. That's that's a great um, that's a great resource, which we've gotten some questions about. Um, so we do have about three minutes left. So um, in two minutes, uh, we have a question from Julie that says, um, "I have a lot of freshmen and sophomores who have not taken um, either composition one or two. And she's wondering which composition skills and how much she should address. 
one thing I always think about um, is, you know, I, I'm always comfortable assigning uh, a writing, uh, writing tasks, uh, writing assignments, because I'm, I know that I'm, I know that specifically the skills that I'm, that I'm teaching and that I'm building into each assignment that I'm hoping students have. So I'm always kind of, I'm always trying to be careful too, if I'm assigning something that isn't writing based, am I, am I kind of doing the work for that? Uh, so for example, I, I don't teach any math in my class, so I, I never assign any, any math homework because uh, I wouldn't even know where to begin. Um, but I think definitely uh, what we one of the things we thought about while we were working on the, the composition learning outcomes is thinking about, you know, writing is not the only thing that we're doing in, in a composition classroom. Um, you know, a lot of it is is a lot of it is group work. A lot of it is discussion. A lot of it is, is uh, ideation uh, in a lot of ways. Um, and so, again, thinking about there are natural opportunities where we can see these, these skills that transfer between. Um, and if we feel that that you know a student is is uh, you know deficit in one of those areas, we can always kind of adjust our our teaching around that. Kind of thinking about well, if I can see what's transferring in, I thought about this specifically with with composition two. I knew what was transfer what skills we were hoping would transfer in for comp one, and as the second the second class in a, in, a, in that series and kind of the end of it, then I had to think about okay, where are all these students going? Where am I sending them? And thinking about what skills am I sending them them out there with? So I'd say, uh, and kind of like Don talked about, thinking about where does your course occur uh, in in um, uh, when your students are taking it? What are they taking already, or what are they taking next? I think is one way to kind of think about that and, and address if there if there are areas of deficit, how we can transfer back and forth. It's a, it's a two way street. Thank you so much, Caleb. That's a great answer. Um, and unfortunately, uh, I do need to. Um, wrap up because we said till 1215, um, but I really appreciate both of your feedback on the questions. Thank you. Um, and to all the attendees, thank you so much for coming to this talk. Please join us for the workshops being hosted by Educational Technology and Innovation. The first one is focused on developing course learning outcomes for better student outcomes, and they're holding it Tuesday, October 10th from 630 to 730 and Thursday, October 12th, 11.30 to 12.30. Both of those are over Zoom. The second workshop, Saving Time with Rubrics, is also being held over Zoom, Tuesday, November 14th, 6.30 to 7.30 p.m., and Thursday, November 16th, 11.30 to 12.30 p.m. And we will be sending out reminders, so um, no worries there. But we hope to see you there, and thanks so much for attending today. <laughs>